So this is a language in which everybody tells me I must learn. By the way, I just turned off alerts, so suck it. YouTube, okay, suck on that. Um, but this is the language I get probably the most amount of heresy to learn is Nim. It's either Nim or Odin. And those two just seem to be the most popular. But man, do I get a lot of Nim gang. Nim, 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 Nim gang, Nim gang, Nim gang. Like it's just constant. The Nim team is proud and happy to announce Nim 2.0. Man, Rust seething right now. They can't 2.0. They, you know, there, there's talks about it, but they can't do it. Uh, cope and seethe, people. Uh, this is an evolution, not a revolution of N uh, NIM. Bringing orc... What? Why are there orcs? Orc memory management as a default. What is orc memory management? Like, I know what arcs are. I know what RCs are. But what's an orc? What's the O stand for? I assume it's something refer reference count? Oracle. Okay, so it's an oracle reference counter. Object relational crap. Not sure what any of that means. Anyways, this seems... <laughs> Seems exciting. <laughs> Memory management as default, along with many other new f uh, features and improvements. NIM is a programming language that is good for everything, but not for everybody. It focuses on imperative programming paradigm and enhances it with macro system. So I actually really like this because, I mean, ultimately in the end, I know procedural code is just really easy. It can be very awful sometimes, but I, I end up enjoying it. You know, for whatever reason, I always end up enjoying it the most. Uh, it's customizable memory management makes it well suited for unforgiving domains such as hard real-time systems and system programmings in general. All right. And so we have a little installing. We won't. Sorry. Installing NeoVim or uh, NIM if you want to. Donating to NIM. Hey, check this out. They take Bitcoin or Open Collective. Go give them some money. So new features. Let's do this. Again, I've always wanted to learn this language. I've just never taking the time to learn it. Okay, tuple unpacking for variables is now treated as syntax sugar that directly expands into multiple assignments. Along with this, tuple unpacking for variables can now be nested. Oh, cool. So here's a tuple, obviously. Uh, uh, this is a fourple. Uh, and in the fourple, the first position has a uh, tuple in it. Oh, cool. Hey, cool. I could like that. Could you like that? I could like that. Improved type inference, a new form of type inference called top-down inference. Okay, but when are we going to get middle-out inference? Okay, I'm sick and tired of this Hindley Mil Milner, Hindley Milner inference or TypeScript inference, but now we got top-down inference. I want middle-out, okay? If you can't find the lowest distance between two points of inferencing, what are you really even doing? Uh, has been implemented for a variety of basic cases. For example, code like this now compiles. Okay, let's see it. A foo, which is a sequence of float byte C string, is this right here. Okay, cool. There must have been this little add symbol or something must have just been something else. Forbidden tags. Ooh, I love anything that's forbidden. Uh, tag tracking now supports the definition of forbidden tags by dot forbids. Pragma, uh, which is used uh, to disable certain effects in proc types. So, for example, you have this whole like type IO. We can read, uh, read line tags IO, discard, echo line void. No I.O., please. Forbids I.O. Oh, interesting. So something I see right away that's kind of cool, or this notion, right? Right away, something that I think is kind of neat about that is that, like, imagine you had some, some really speedy, some really hot functions going on. Some just hot, Hansel hot. And you want to ensure that they don't do certain operations. You could imagine that you could tag certain things, and just say, hey, you're not allowed to use these tags within this function because it's so hot right now. It's Hansel hot. There's something kind of cool about that, right? It's useful for teams. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. This seems actually really useful for a team because you could you could imagine that you just come to a point of a piece of code you've never seen before. It's just sitting there and you're like, okay, I don't, what, what am I looking at? Well, what are you asking me to do? You have to do a small bug fix. So you just start putting stuff in it. And you don't realize that you're about to like downgrade the entire system because you're in the hottest function. <sighs> so hot. Uh, forbid. Give intern forbid code. Yeah, that could be a good one. All right. I like that. That's actually a pretty cool idea. Uh, I mean, I like it for communication purposes. Very, very neat. Uh, new standard library modules. Uh, the famous OS module got an overhaul. Several of its features are available under a new interface that produces path abstractions. A path is a distinct string, which improves the type safety when dealing with paths, files, and directories. Uh, all right, so you got a bunch of new stuff coming out. Okay, I like that. Uh, overloaded enums, overloadable enums are no longer experimental. For example, enum value one, enum value two. Okay. I'm not really sure what I'm looking at here. 
What does this mean? The types E1 and E2 share the names value 1 and value 2. They are overloaded, and usually overload disambiguation is used so that E1 and E2 prefixes can be left out in many cases. Okay. You, get, you give it the same shape. Okay. So the point is you give it the same shape so you don't have to do uh, E1 dot this. It just works. You can just do that. And it goes, I already know. I, I get it. I get it. These features are most beneficial for independently developed libraries. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Weird. I know it's a super weird language, but people just nonstop talk about this. You've always had the prefix, the enums with their type name. Yeah. So this just, this just allows that to effectively not happen. Okay. Default values for objects. Inside an object declaration, fields can now have default values. Relational object. Okay, cool. So it could be an int. Here's the default value. Perfect. You get this thing. You get a new relational. Boom. You got that. Okay, good. I, li I like that. I like default values. Default values are really cool. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of exciting. Duck typing in my compiled language. What the f <laughs> Yeah, it's happening. Uh, definitely assign, uh, definite assignment analysis. We found NIMS default initialization rule has been one of the major source of bugs. There's a new experimental switch called strict defs that protects against these bugs. When enabled, it enforces that a variable has been given a value explicitly before the variable can be used. Oh, very cool. Oh, awesome. Okay, that's great. I love that. I love that. Perfect. So it's just good linting right there. Bil building good linting into the system. I love to see that. Uh, let's see. To turn the warning into an error, use uh, warning as error uh, on init on. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, the, uh, the analysis understands basic control flow, so, the, uh, so following works because every possible code path uh, signs are before it is used. Nice. Okay, cool. I love that because this is such an annoying thing when you get into, uh, when you get into uh, conditions where... Like, my least favorite part about TypeScript is when you're in a for loop and you have to index into the thing you're using and you check to see if the index item is there, but then right afterwards, you can't continue to use the index item. So I wonder if this works in the same, the same kind of concept. Can an indexed item work because I does not change? I don't know. It'd be cool to, it'd be cool to find out because it always makes me just so frustrated. Uh, even better. This feature works with let variables too. All right, let rational, this, this, this. Okay, cool. Uh, it, it is checked that every let variable is assigned a value exactly once. Perfect. I do like that. That is a cool feature. So a let variable, if, if I'm reading this correctly, a let variable is something that can only be assigned once. It's effectively a const, but you don't have to define it in place. You can do something like this. I can dig. I always wanted that. That's one of those things that I've always wanted because I always have like, I need to assign a value and there's like a bunch of things I might have to do to do something. Obviously something like OCaml or Rust kind of gets around it because expressions can return stuff, but JavaScript, you can't do it, right? So if you have a bunch of if state, like you can't do that in JavaScript. Isn't that just a standard ML derived? Like, yes, yes. But I'm just saying that there's like this thing that happens that it's, it's just... You can think of it as a runtime const. Cool. Side effects. Sort pointer to T, right? So I just see this as sort a pointer to an array T. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, here, the, let's see. The meaning here is that sort has, an effect, uh, has effects of compare sort and can raise exceptions comp. Comp proc this int closure order. See, I... NIM seems too strange for me to try to understand. I'm trying to understand it, but I, you know, obviously only looking at it for 10 seconds, it's really hard to understand. Improved error message uh, for a type mismatch. Okay. Foo4 produces, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, you got overloading in this language. Okay. So you got overloading in this language and it says, hey, type mismatch, you can't do this. Hey, at least it's good. It's good error messages, right? It's good error messages. I like that. Oh, star is not a pointer. It's a declaration of public function. Oh, okay. Okay. Consistent underscore handling. The underscore identifier is now generally, let's see, is now generally not added to a scope when used uh, as the name of a definition. While this was the case for a variables, it is now also the case for routine parameters, generic parameters, routine declarations, type declarations, etc. This means the following code does not compile. All right, foo, plus one. Why would you do this? See, whereas the following code does compile. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, so you can no longer, you can. Why doesn't this compile? I'm, I, let's see. So this does this 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 doesn't work because you can't do this, right? This doesn't work because you can't do this, but this is fine. It's this that's not fine. Is that what it's saying? Ah, uh, you just gotta look at code. You gotta generalize. You gotta kind of just just you know work through a problem. Try to like try to argue with yourself why something does and doesn't. You know, it's a good it's good for the brain. It's good for the brain to try to see things in a different light, right? JavaScript code gen improvement. JavaScript backend now uses big int for 64 integer types. Uh, big int is the bane of my life. It, you cannot JSON stringify and parse big ints, which is just like the devil. It's just the devil. As this affects JS code generation, code using the types to interface with JS backend may need to be able to update. Note that int and uint are not affected. Okay, for compatibility with platforms that do not support big int, the case of potential bugs with this new implementation, the old behavior is still currently supported on the command line option that. Okay, so you got some doc code gen. Very cool. I don't think we care about docs. We don't write docs around here. C++ interop, uh, interop enhancements. Okay, this is actually pretty cool. Nim takes the C++ interop uh, to the next level with a uh, new virtual pragma and the extended constructor pragma. Uh, now one can define constructors and virtual procs that map to C++ constructors and virtual methods, allowing for further customization with interoperability. This allows extended support for the code gen uh, decimal, de decal pragma. Okay, let's see what this is. Struct base int. Okay. Okay, we got so okay, okay, this, okay, okay. Type base, we got this thing. Notice that we can access this inside the constructor. What is going on here? Because this, okay, so like uh, this, this looks like we're doing some C plus plus up here. This looks like some C plus plus up here. But now we're actually taking this, import C++, and you're just like literally interopping with C++ while you're writing it? The NIM feels like three languages in a trench coat, a NIM++. I, I think that that's pretty cool. Uh, for anyone that does, you know, anyone that does a lot of C++ and they wish they had a language that was a little bit easier to write, <laughs> which, here's the problem. Okay, so I'm going to be real here. Everyone that likes to do C++ doesn't want another language to use. So I'm not really sure who, like, in all reality, I'm not really sure who you're actually advertising this stuff to. As far as I can tell, people that like C++ like C++. When they build a new program, they build it in C++. What about Carbon? Yeah, I mean, I see, pe I see people excited about it, but I just doubt that Carbon, I mean, I, I really doubt that that's going to take off. But it got too messy. But why? I don't know. That's, I use Odin now. Odin seems very exciting. Okay, Arc, uh, Arc and Orc uh, refinements with a 2.0 release. Arc and Orc model got redefined once again and now have finally complete programmers now have control over the item. Was moved from state with this. Was moved override. There's new a dupe hook, which is more efficient than the old combination was moved. Hmm. This stuff seems... I feel like Nim is going to take a, a ton of understanding. Like, if, if if you were to get into Nim, it seems like it takes a lot of understanding. When I read all this stuff, I always come down to the same problem, which is, what is being solved here? You know, like, what? why why would someone, why would someone here, there, there has to be people that use Nim in, in, in here. Uh, yeah, it doesn't feel like a normal language. Why do you use Nim? Why do you use Nim over using a language that's already been around? Nim was good for me to transfer uh, from knowing Python to something else. A good stepping stone to using something else. Okay, there's there's some Nimmers. That's uh, that's what I learned ten years ago. Writing langs is fun, but I uh, feel like uh, there's saturation in the space. Yeah, I use Nim to write exploits when I don't have a lot of time. Same reason why I use Rust to brag about it. Yeah, okay, it's a it's a talk only language. I like pain. Why use any other language than Rust? Well, have you heard of my friend OCaml? Um, I feel like Nim's learning curve is worse than Rust. Yeah, you read the patch notes? Uh, or read a tutorial. I know I'm reading the patch notes. Why is there yet another one? It, you, let's see. Uh, you use it to get free trips to conferences? Odin Camel? 
Uh, have you heard of uh, Have you heard of my camel? N just no. My ca O camel, not my, your your camel. O camels. I uh, haven't heard of a uh, greyhound in a hot minute. Yeah, I know it's here. We're we're listening to it. Why are we learning O camel? Probably the same reason for people to learn Nim. Uh, o camel is having a very large and faster industry adoption right now. It's in a very great place. It's really primed to become a language that actually might. It might become the first more mainstream functional language. I think it actually has a chance. Because I don't think there's a mainstream functional language uh, right now. And what I mean by that is that if someone says Haskell, you know they're just... It's not true. Um, uh, Scala, F Sharp, F Sharp is not mainstream. Elixir, I don't think it's... Maybe. Elixir and OCaml are probably pretty near each other. But they're just not like... It's not, it's not, Elixir is pretty mainstream. No, it's not. Because that's the thing is I know virtually nobody that knows a, a functional programming language. That means it's not mainstream. Everybody knows C-based style languages. Like that's that. That's a mainstream language. Elixir is growing. It's not mainstream yet. Exactly. Elixir has potential to be the first. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's mainstream for a very specific niche use group, right? You mean it's not web dev. It's not just that. It's not web dev. It's typically not CLI. It's typically not this. It's typically not that. It's typically not servers, right? Elixir has the greatest chance because right now Elixir it has a really good, strong story around uh, servers, and I think they're kind of they're kind of winning. OCaml is a very practical, functional language. You can write imperative if you need to. Yeah. So for me, it has first off, OCaml is the most amazing type system I've ever used in my lifetime. It is fantastic. Notice that I virtually I haven't set a single type yet. Everything in this file is completely typed, right? Because this thing is typed, it knows that, okay, this thing is an option of int. So therefore, this is that. So when I do the match, it has to have sum and none. That means handle to do has to take in an ID. This means that handle to do has to return uh, a dream response that's threaded. And if it doesn't, it means that uh, when I try to return something else, this thing is going to error, right? So if I go here and go... Uh, Right, and I just go, uh, what is it? Uh, five, right? I, I suck at this kind of stuff. Uh, how, how do you how do you stop a match statement? See, I'm still pretty new to this stuff. Begin, uh, and there we go. Uh, there we go. This, uh, see, look at this. It's already telling you this is supposed to have a certain expression, but it's not having it. Therefore, it's not it's not working. Your type is wrong here. You're doing the wrong type. But when I go this uh, this beauty. It goes, no, your type is now right. It can now be used how it's supposed to be used. And I just think that that's so fantastic. It has such a strong typing system that it's incredible. Uh, what's a strong use case? I really like it for uh, processing stuff. I think it could become... Uh, I think that it could become my new favorite CLI language. Because right now I write a lot of CLI applications. And I could... I, I can find myself liking more and more using it for CLIs right was written to write compilers exactly it's like it's a very cli friendly language and so i i keep seeing it over and over again that i'm like okay i'm going to learn it and now that i'm starting to learn it i go this is fantastic and the thing about ocaml is that it it has a really strong you know ecosystem right now it's actually shockingly strong so again it always comes back to the same thing nim what are you like is it because you like writing programming languages or are you solving a real thing? Like I think of Odin. Odin is a language designed for game programming. It's designed for graphics programming. Maybe it would be a better way to say it. Jai is another language designed specifically for a niche use case, which means that it can be very, very good. What is Nim's niche use case? I don't know. Like I, I, I don't, I don't, I have no idea. And so that's what I want to see is what is the niche use case for this? What are you trying to solve that can be solved better than any other language? Now, when it comes to when it comes to game programming again, Odin, Odin just has like really amazing things. And it's just as really great. A tunable GC isn't isn't a use case, right? It's not something that's a huge win. A tunable GC just makes a language that should be fast, faster, like Go. Like if you can do an arena allocation in Go, you just made your program from 99 to 99.5% faster. So that's cool, but it's not a reason to switch from, say, Go to Nim. Does that make sense?
And the name is the Nimogen. 